Hey, good afternoon. What a beautiful day it was today, huh? Amen. <laughs> well, we had fun today. We had, um, we're staying with the, I was with the men's, the college uh, men, and we had Q&A and just talking, and it was a blessing, like three hours, and it was just <laughs> transparency and just questions and just drilling me. <laughs> But it's just beautiful to be real. I'm gonna switch up and do a little, and then my wife was also with the college women, and they're blessed as well. So it was really good. I'm gonna switch up and do a little bit, switch to like teaching mode because I love teaching. It's not my passion. So we're gonna do that. So we have like mics. So if you have any questions or um, any time, just raise your hand and we can go through that. I may have to finish a thought and you can continue on, and you can answer. You can ask a question. Or I'm gonna, also I'm going to have some little breakout sessions to kind of just think about little thoughts where you can reflect upon. So if you have your Bibles, turn to me to Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. And we're looking at, if you handouts, there's something, uh, a handout was, I think it was emotional pain relievers. Did you guys see that one? You can pull that one out. Healing for addictions. Now, we talked about sexual purity for women last night, sexual purity for men, and um, you want to use this one, that one? Does that look nicer than this on, this, on the camera? <laughs> he told me I couldn't go down because, you know, <laughs> the lighting. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a little bit more comfortable. Thank you. Okay, how's this? Is this good? <laughs> so, um, so we have a lot of emotional wounds. Now, not in this world of sin, not only have we all sinned, but have we now all been sinned against as well, right? So, with that, it leads a lot of wounds and brokenness. And I think of, this, of any generation that has lived, this is the broken generation, Generation Z at this time now. Millennials have gone. And so this generation is a broken generation. And so when I was passing, I was realizing, wait a minute, this is not, just teaching the intellectual knowledge is not working because why would they want to listen to um, intellectual knowledge if they're hurting on the inside? But it's kind of like the health message, why do they want to listen to the, your, your teachings if actually they're suffering from pain or bone cancer on the inside. Does that make sense? Like you have to help in, like Jesus, he sought to heal them first, right? He did the healing first phys physically, and then he helped him to, to heal spiritually. Like relieve their pain, right? You have to, that's how you win people's hearts, and that's what Jesus did. He won their confidence. He relieved, ministered unto them. That's what you, we need to do. And then at the end, then you say, then, Follow me, right? That's clear. Let me say amen. Amen? So we have to minister and really follow ministry of healing. The true health message is, is a complete healing physically, emotionally, and spiritually. So um, I want to focus on that this, this afternoon. And many Christians remain in a, some type of pain, like emotional pain. It's not only physical pain, but emotional pain with a suffering. And it could have been like a divorce uh, from the struggles that they've gone through. They don't have a good relationship with their dad. Um, the mom is verbally abusive. So all these different things are gone through. And um, we were talking with the, with the guys about, about addictions and even sexual addictions in the past. And all the guys, which was an extremely high majority, who struggled with pornography, um, we all looked at it and we said, hey, look, there's a connection that we all have some kind of hurting relationship in our, in our, in our lives. So there's a direct correlation with the brokenness. And you're going to see that from the Word of God here and actually the solution to that. So what people do is Christians turn to sinful habits as emotional vacations away from the pain. The problem is that whenever we turn from these vacations, uh, from the rea back to reality, the pain is still there. Is that, that not true? So sometimes you may go into the emotional lusting and fantasy world of Prince Charming, all that, as an escape 
escapism, to escape from reality. But when you come back from that false world into the real world, you're going to realize that that pain is still there. You may escape to sexual pleasures, whether you do fornication or uh, self-abuse, and it, escape to that way, enjoy for a little while. But when you come back to the world, real world, um, the pain is still there. And so God wants us to heal from that pain because that's the root cause. And if we focus on that, on that healing, God can do uh, great and mighty things through us. So with that, let's pray. Father, as your word is open, help us to see what you want us to learn and teach us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis 127. What were we created in? We have the roving mics. Is that right? The mics ready? Okay. So, can somebody read that, please? Maybe you can read it loud or read it into the mic at this time. I'm going to let you interact a little bit after a, a good lunch and Sabbath rest. Okay. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Okay, we were created in the image of what? Of who? God, okay. Now, who is God? What is God? God's creator? What else is God? God is love. So if we were created in the image of God, we were created as an exact duplicate of God, right? In the sense that God, in the, in the Godhead, right, they, they love each other. They love and they also they also are loved, right? So in the image of God, God created us to love, but God also created us to be loved. Does that make sense, right? And if we don't have that love and to be loved, then we're going to die in every which way. It's, it's actually a proven fact, and they actually did that, that experiment, and I believe it was actually in the dark ages, where the babies, infants deprived of direct human contact, right? What happened to them? They died. So we were created to love and to be loved. And if we don't have that love, we're going to die spiritually, especially because God is love. That's who God is. And so we were created with that. So when we don't get that, we feel empty. We feel lonely. We feel depressed. And God is the only one who can feel that because God is love. So many Christians today who have never experienced this kind of love of God, they've never seen it in the home from their parents and they feel with the emptiness and pain. So look at the quotation from the handout that I handed out to you. And notice what it says. It says, Ministry of Healing, page 375. It says, Great is the honor and the responsibility placed upon who? Fathers and mothers. Why? In that they are to stand in the place of what? God to their children. By teaching the child to love and trust and obey them, they are teaching him to love and trust and obey his what? Father where? In heaven. So what is this saying to you? What is this quotation saying to you? Anyone? That home is a parallel of our relationship with God. A home is a parallel of our relationship with God. Okay, good. Chris? The way we relate to our parents is the way that we relate to God. Okay, the way we relate to our parents is the way that we relate to God. Okay, good. Very good. Anyone else? What else do you see in this quotation? So what does that mean in the way that we relate to our parents, we relate to God? What does that mean, Chris? It means the way that I see my earthly father the way that he is is the way that I imagine my, my heavenly father to be. Do you guys get that? Say that again. Sometimes you have to say it one more time. The way that I see my earthly father to be is the way that I imagine my heavenly father to be. Did you guys get that? So how you're raised by your parents will determine what type of picture you're going to have of God our Father in heaven. Does that make sense? So what if you had a bad relationship with your parents? What do you think is going to happen? You're going to have a what? a bad picture of who God is. Does that make sense to you? So do you think that your relationship with your parents and how you're raised is going to affect your relationship with God? What if your father abandoned you and every time he said that he's going to be there for you, he was never there for you? What do you think is going to happen to you? And your relationship with God I'm talking about. 
Do you know there's people out Christians who say they're Christian, but they don't trust God, right? Because they were actually conditioned not to trust God because how they're raised from their parents. Does that make sense? So our picture of God is largely determined based upon how you and I are raised. And unlearning is harder than learning. So to unlearn that picture or that false picture is hard. So God wants to, what God wants to do is re-educate us, yeah, who he really is. And that's why even Moses, the Israelites, had to leave Egypt, right? And it took them 40 years of re-education in the wilderness before they're able to enter into the promised land. But it is possible because of God, all things are possible. What do you say, amen? So God, that is the quotation that I want you to just think about. So my question to you is, and I like to do the active thinking because I think you need to be thinkers and not mere reflectors of my thoughts. <laughs> so I want you to think about this question, and the question is this, where have you been wounded in your life? Just kind of think about that. Where have you been wounded in your life? You know, I'm going to give you, and those who are watching on television right now, why don't you answer that question as well? Where have you been wounded in your life? And I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about that. How does that sound? This silence, and just think about that. Where have you been wounded in your life? I'm going to put in the timer, and 30 seconds. Okay, at this time, I'm going to break it and find a partner and discuss your answer to that question. The best thing is to write down your answer, and then you can talk it over. So I'm going to give you a minute or two minutes to talk about it. If you're at home, um, turn to your spouse or your children and, or your friend and talk about it and share your answer with one another. How's that sound? Okay? So you got, uh, I'll give you a minute or two. Go ahead. Active discussion. Okay, all right. Let's wrap it up and we come back. Turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now think about this. If you were Satan and you knew that you were made in the image of God and God is love and you thrived on love, what would you want to do? Make sure that what? That you don't feel love. Does that make sense, right? That you have a low self-worth. You're worth nothing in this world. You're abandoned by your family. You're not even worth the time of your own dad. You're worth nothing, right? Wouldn't he kind of do that to you? So he'll play with your mind. He'll play with your, your worth, your self-worth, your self-respect. And... That lie began in the Garden of Eden with Eve. So we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3. I know that I looked at it from a different angle last night, but we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3 from a different angle once again. Because you can look at Genesis chapter 3 from many different angles. So let's look at how Satan told that lie of not being loved to Eve. So turn your Bible to Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. What did a serpent insinuate about God? Could somebody read that please? Uh, we have the mic there. Just raise your hand and you can read it for the microphone. So... The television can hear it. Thank you. Now the, serp the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the, of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Okay, so what was Satan implying? That God, what do you think he's implying in this Bible text? about? We're looking at what was he implying, implying about God that was not true? What do you think he's trying to imply in this Bible text? What do you see? He had to be transparent and honest. Okay. What else? Okay. He's withholding, withholding something good, right? From Eve, right? And what is that? What is he withholding in this Bible text? He's withholding what? Yeah, he's withholding, I mean... You're holding something that you can't get everything in here. So in other words, it seemed like God was making God out to be this God who was, who was what? Being what? Self and, and restrictive in a sense, right? Like restrictive, like abusive, like there's not type of God that um, you type of love, right? Controlling. And can you love someone who is very restrictive, controlling, and abusive? Very hard to. So he paints his this first picture of who God the Father is to Eve, right? That's what he, and that's what he wants to do to you. He wants you to understand God is restrictive. God is abusive. Christianity is restrictive, right? But Christianity really is freeing. The world is restrictive. When you get out into the real world, they're very controlling. They're very restrictive. They use fear to control you in all aspects 
to be in like them, to look like them, to act like them. And the Christian is really divergent. They're totally different, and no one really can't really place, put their finger upon you because you're free and you're happy and you're not controlled what other people think about you. Does that make sense? What do you say? Amen? So the devil is a liar and he's telling his false picture that God is restrictive. And it's hard to make love that God like that. What else did God, Satan, do about this false picture that you're not loved by God? What did a serpent say about eating the fruit? Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. Could somebody read that, please? Okay. Yes, there's a mic. Yeah. <laughs> and there. And hmm. Oh. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. Okay. Amen. So what did um what did the serpent say? That you are not what? You're not gonna die. So what is he saying about God, you think here? God is a what? He's a liar, right? So now he's restrictive, he's abusive, controlling. But at the next thing, God is a liar. Can you, can you trust someone who actually is always lying? How many of you have had a friend who lied to you? How do you feel? It's heartbroken. Like, I, to me, like, you can do anything you want to me in a relationship, and I, you know, I'm very forgiving. But the moment you break my trust and you lie to me, like, how can I trust you anymore? Does that make sense? And like, wow, I, if God's a liar, can I really trust that type of God, right? Can I put my trust in his word? If, are you following me? So many times we tell people, we look at the symptoms, like they don't trust in the word of God. Say, so you just got to believe, right? Okay, that's nice. But if they're dealing with something in the past where their father said, I'm going to come for Christmas and never came for one Christmas to see you, they're conditioned to not trust and their picture of their father not trusting, right? They put that picture upon God, right? Same lie today. And so just tell them that you need to have a strong will and trust you, they need to heal from their past brokenness of learn, to learn to trust again because they built walls around their heart because they've been hurt so many times. But like Jericho, we've got to march around that wall seven times and that wall will come crumbling down. What do you say, amen? amen? So God can still do those miracles today in your heart and my heart. So the first picture, God is abusive, controlling, restrictive, lie. But he believed it. Because she wouldn't have eaten the fruit. Hey, Eve, remember? Eat this fruit. She wouldn't have eaten the fruit. But Satan had to paint a false... Because why, why wouldn't she want to eat the fruit? What do you think so? Because why? Okay, God said don't do it, and you don't do it because God said don't do it. What else? What? She loved God. She was in love with God, right? And whatever... God says because she loved him, she would do it. But what Satan knew that if he said, here, Eve, eat the fruit, she wouldn't have eaten the fruit. He had to get into her mind, paint a false picture that God doesn't love you, then said, that's right, God don't love me. I'm not going to love him back. Right? Does that make sense? So he get into her mind first, and he's painting a false picture of God's restrictive, controlling, abusive. Now God's a liar. He's lying to you. Do you see that? He's painting a false picture. Okay, the next thing, what happened next? Um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. What else does Satan insinuate about God? Because somebody read that, please. For God has known that in the day you eat thereof, and your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay, so here we have Satan saying in the lie, if you eat this, we talked about it last night, you're going to be as God. So what does he think another picture that he's trying to paint? What do you think? That God is what? Withholding something good. So what does that mean about God? Like God's, Satan's saying, you know God, he's up there. You know, he's up in heaven. He doesn't want you to eat up this fruit because if you eat this fruit, you're going to be just like God. And he wants to be God all by himself. Therefore, that means he's trying to paint a picture that God must be what? Selfish. Does that make sense? So God is restrictive, abusive, controlling. God is a liar. You can't trust him. You can't trust his word. Whatever word he says, you can't believe any word he says because he's a liar. And worst of all, God is selfish. He don't care about you. He just care about himself. He's just like your daddy was, right? Are you following me? 
So he's painting this false picture, and he's mind, he does the same thing to us today. All these different things, he painted this false picture. And then he's getting you, if you believe these lies of Satan today, through means of people, through your mom and your dad and how they treated you, if you believe these lies, your relationship with God is going to suffer. And that's why people, love makes obedience easy, right? People suffer with the obedience part because they have a heart issue. They have a love issue with God. And really, they have a heart issue with God. Is Why? Because in the past, they believed the lives of humans of who they, they made an image of God based upon how the Father treated them. And they believed this false image or false picture of who God was, just like Satan did, and it messes up our life. Any, any thoughts or any questions anyone had? Okay, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say something else that I yes. saw was that Satan made it seem like there was something more that she was missing out on mm. because God had placed them in the perfect place with everything perfect, yeah. but Satan made her discontent by making her believe that there was something better that God had not given her yet. Mm. Amen. Discontent, right? Amen. So this false picture of everything, this really messed them up. Anyone else had any thoughts on this? Okay, go ahead. Judah, in the front. Um, you know, it's, it's so interesting because the way you perceive God, like it's so crucial for all of us here to really know for ourselves what the character of God is. Amen. Because if you have a misunderstanding of how God is, when you get into a relationship, mm. like, like you can barely, like, you know, one has to deal with your own, you know, imperfections, but to deal with another person's imperfection. But when you have the perfect standard that God does forgive and heal, then you can be with another person that, you know, that you're committed to serve God together. Amen. That's a good point because you can still be uh, united with someone but not really, um, really together. And so, like, <clears throat> excuse me, many Christians get together, but because they have a false picture of God, they treat the other person as they see God treating them. Does that make sense? If your picture of God is warped, that God is abusive toward you, you're going to be abusive toward your spouse. And that's why a lot of marriages, even within the church and Seventh Avenue's marriage, is falling apart because really it's based upon the root cause of who God really is. That's why Ellen White says the last message of mercy, how many of you guys know that quotation? The last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of God's what? Character of what? Love. Isn't that beautiful? Amen? Amen. So that's the last message. There's not going to be a last to the last to the last message. There's only going to be one last message, and the last message is a revealing of who God really is because the world has a warped picture of who God is. And not only the world, but unfortunately, Satan has crept into our church and given many Christians and Adventists a wrong picture of who God is. If you're struggling with obedience, many times it's because you have a false picture of who God is. Because you don't really love God in a deep way. Now, there's people out there who want to manipulate you and control you and abuse you. Yes. And that could be a false spirituality and be careful about. But at the same time, if you know you're convicted on the inside, which you should do, but you don't have the power to do it, it's because there's something wrong with our picture of God. Any thoughts on that? Okay. Um, one interesting thing is that when God made man, he did declare from the beginning, man is made in his image. Mm. So that is man made in the likeness of God. So when Satan comes, uh, everything is already fulfilled. So there was no need. And when there is no need present, then all you're left with is to affect people's perce perception of what they have. Because in reality, there is no need present. So what he had to work with is their own perception of what they already have. So then he started to create an imaginary need. Something that is absolutely not existent. And then that is the need of becoming like gods and then blah, blah, blah. Which they were already made in the image of God. And once he was able to do that, 
altered the, the mindset, mm. then everything else was shifted. Mm. And it was a whole another world. And I believe this is exactly what he does to us. It's not necessarily that... Um, okay, it's not necessarily that uh, <clears throat> we have a need, but most of the time is that he's creating uh, our perception of what need is and what want is. So I think that is a very dangerous thing. Amen. If we fall to the light. I mean, good, good point. It's really perception, right? And, and then we think that, well, you know, keep the commandments of God. It says, thou shalt not bow to any graven image, right? But we bow down in our minds. We're talking about, yeah, the Catholic Church, you see the point fingers, you know, they make this image, right, of Joseph and Mary and bow down to it. But actually, we create our own false images of who God is in our own mind. And we bow down to that. Do you think that we could actually be worshiping a false god in our minds when we're really thinking that we're worshiping a true god? Do you think that's possible? Yeah. So we can bow, we can break the commandments of God in our minds and not even know that we're actually doing it. And God wants us to break, smash every idol, break down every idol. What do you say, amen? That's what he wants us to do in our lives. So if you have this brokenness, you're going to feel emptiness and pain. I remember, you have to think root causes. So I remember I went for an altar call and I was praying. I said, you want special prayer this Sabbath? Come up for prayer and anointing. I was at a church and I seen, I never forget this. A mother came down with a, her boy, dragging her boy to the front. <laughs> and I came down. So I went to the front and I was like talking. I was praying with different people and I finally said, okay, what do we want to pray for? And she said, my, um, it's my son. He's been lashing out in anger. And I said, oh, okay. So I asked the son, I asked him, where's your love tank? <laughs> and what I mean by that is that, okay, you're like a love tank. I said, how much love is your body filled up with? Like a water tank? Think of it like that. Like your body is a water tank. How much love do you have? Is it up here or is it down here? Or they up here in the middle? Where is your love tank? And he looked at me. He put his head down. And he went down here below, and he goes right here. And then the mom was embarrassed. She put her head down, because she was blaming it was all his fault. And then I said to the little boy, I said to him, why do you think your love tank is so low? And he said, he put his head down, and he said, because my mom never spends any time with me. And so sometimes we think that the anger issue that he had was we're thinking we just need to discipline this child that he won't be angry. Does that make sense? But really what this child needed was that he was looking, no, no dad, just a mom who never spent time with him. He's looking for love. Is that not true, right? Many times our answers can be solved by love. And if we just look at what is the solution that this child, but you have to find out what is the specific solution that they're going through. They're going through certain things like they're not feeling not enough time, then that's the solution. Every person has a different solution, but you have to find out, just like the physical realm, you have to get the correct diagnosis, you got to get the correct diagnosis in the spiritual realm, and you have to deal it in that way. So we knelt down and we prayed for healing. So my question next, and this is where you answer for yourself for 30 seconds, where in your life have you not felt unconditionally loved? I give you 30 seconds. Go ahead. Where in your life have you not felt unconditionally love? Unconditionally now, love. Wrap it up. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. What did Eve do next? Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Can somebody read that, please? Maybe you ra raise your hand and read into the mic? Genesis 3, verse 6. 3, verse 6? 3, 6? Verse six. Three, six? Uh -huh. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant for the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So now, she's after Satan messed with her mind and changed everything, now she's fallen out, out of love with God. And now that she's fallen out of love with God, which was Satan's plan, now he can get her to fall into addiction and sin. Does that make sense? So Satan wants us to fall out of love with God. 
And once he does that, then he has you. Because now there's no protection. Now you're not going to obey God because your heart doesn't want to. And so he does that today with modern Adam and Eve as well, and, and Adam as well. So God wants us to see a true picture, and that's why the whole battle of the great controversy is a great, great controversy between Christ and Satan, and it's a battle over who God is, right? That's the whole battle of the characters. And that's what's happening in this whole great controversy between heaven and earth, between Christ and Satan. And that's what, you know, we sell the book Great Controversy, but that's what the whole Great Controversy is really all about, a battle of characters. So there's a lot of addictions that are out there. And this was actually the first food addiction <laughs> was actually what Eve did. And you know, appetite, right, and passions, right? If we can overcome appetite, there's a quote that's very similar that says we we're able to overcome all sins, right? So this, our appetite being controlled is very important in our Christian walk and what we do. So we have to realize that just the food addiction, example, I was, I was meeting with this young lady and she was talking about she wanted prayer. And she shared with me, after I shared one of the messages on healing, she was sharing to me that she was very in fit and in shape and an athlete and, it, and she was very good at what she did. She's very slender. She said, but after she was sexually abused as a child, and one day she remembered something happened when she triggered, when she forgotten about what happened in the past, but she remembered her past and what happened, and that's when she began to actually eat a lot, and she began to gain a lot of weight. And she finally clicked in her mind that it was when that trigger, what, the pain that happened in the past, that she began to overeat, and that's when she began to gain a lot of weight. And so they found that those with sexual, been sexual abused in the past, they struggle with actually overeating when they're older as well. So there's correlations and connections between the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. And Jesus always connected all three, right? He went around preaching the word of God, right, which is the spiritual, and teaching ev everyone, which is the mental. And then also it says that he healed all manner of diseases, right, which is the physical. It's a blend of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual all together. And that's how Jesus healed. He, he was concerned about every aspect of your life. I realized this. I was in Northern California at a church, and there was this, the, we were praying. I was praying for different people, and at the end, there was this one guy kept walking back and forth and wanted to talk to me and said, when well, you want to talk, and said, no, why don't you talk with everyone else, and after everyone's gone, and you pray with everyone, then I want to talk to you. I said, okay. So we stayed really late. It was actually turned to like 11 o'clock on Saturday night, and um, after all the meetings were done at 7. And finally, I was able to talk with him, and said, could you just pray for me? I said, okay, can you help me discover what my root cause is? I said, okay, let's pray. So we prayed, and then he said to me, you know, I struggle with anger, I'm a very angry person, and I'm a struggle with sexual addiction, pornography. I said, okay, so I tried to find the root causes, and I couldn't do it, and he kept saying to me over and over, you know, I have something to tell you, but I don't know if you're able to handle it. And I was so exhausted, I said, I kind of didn't want to go there because it's kind of emotionally draining, <laughs> and I didn't go there, and then I tried to find his root cause, I couldn't find it, and finally he said to me, there's something I need to tell you, but I don't think you're able to handle it. And then I said to myself, Okay, I, s I better do this. So I said, okay, go ahead, tell me. He said when he was younger, he was in the medical profession. He was in his 60s when I met with him. When he was in his 20s, he was in, his, um, he was in school, and uh, he was in the hospital room with his one little girl, like 10 years old, and she was on the machine. And remember that something happened, he said, and he panicked, and he flipped the wrong switch, and he panicked and he froze and he didn't flip it back and because he couldn't flip it back he just froze that little girl died and he said he has not told anyone his whole life 40 years can you imagine the guilt the pain the suffering wanting to escape from that pain that's why he goes toward pornography and sexual addiction, anger, right? The miserable feeling of going through all of that and not telling a soul. Can you imagine holding that burden upon yourself? And sometimes we, and this is at a church, Adventist church, so you're thinking 
that just because they look good on the outside and look really nice, does not necessarily mean that everything is well on the inside. Does that make sense? If someone is mean, we have a saying in our school, it's actually on our banner, it says, hurt people, hurt people, heal people, heal people. Now, one time I went to a place and it said, why do you write a sign that says, you need to hurt people, hurt people? <laughs> but that's not what it's saying. It's saying that hurt people, in other words, if you've been hurt, you're going to hurt other people. But those who've been healed from their hurt, they're going to be used as wounded healers to heal other people. What do you say, amen? The Bible says to comfort others with the same what? Comfort, comfort we have what? Comfort. Received of God. In other words, you only can comfort other people if you first have been comforted and healed by God first, right? And I want to say you cannot give that which what? You do not possess. So you have to be healed first. And that's why when I see people who are moody who are grumpy, I understand more and I'm more patient understanding that they're, the reason why they're so mean to me and they're hurting me is because... They're hurting themselves. They haven't healed and they need healing. Can you imagine the patience that you get understanding that concept? You're going to be more patient with people. You're going to be more loving toward people. You want to go and help them more so. And that's what God wants us to do. Any thoughts on this so far? Okay, go ahead. Maybe into the mic because they want it for the camera. Go ahead. Uh, just a flip side, um, okay. Adam and Eve came from a loving home. Um, they walked and talked with God, so they really loved God. What about those who have, um, they're coming from a loving home. Yeah. Um, is it possible that they can actually open a door that will lead them into um, a certain sin or certain disposition? Uh, whether it be anger or, um, you know, just about anything that, that uh, stealing, she says. But, yeah, yeah. But, but, but can you go on the enemy's enchanted ground that actually leads you into these areas? Yeah, sure. I mean, God, I'm sure, was a perfect parent to uh, Lucifer. And people can still make their own decision. And in their own mind... The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, right? Oh, okay. So the story of the prodigal son. The father was a good father, was he not, right? But he ran away from home thinking it was an abusive home and he wanted to get away from that home, have fun. And, but what, what, happened, what triggered his repentance was that he remembered that how many of my servants have food enough to eat, right? In other words, in his mind, he remembered that my father's a good God all the time. But he didn't realize it until that moment. And the Bible says in Romans 2 verse 4, it says, the goodness of God, what? Leads us to repentance. So that means that, see, you can't come to repentance of your own and say, I need to be sorry, I need to be sorry, I need to be sorry. You can't do that. The only thing that leads you to repentance is that you must see the goodness of God first. And that will lead you to repentance. So he had a false picture of who his father was until he said, wait a minute, my father is good. And then he got repentant and he came back home. And I think that you can still in the world of sin. I don't know if that helps that you can. You still have a choice. God grants us freedom to choose. I don't know if that answered or yeah, kind of. We can ask me after then. How's that sound? Okay. Any other question or thought? Okay, go ahead. In Matthew 16, uh, verse 5, 6, and 7, there's something quite interesting happening. The disciples were supposed to take bread somewhere. They forgot bread. And just like any other humans, when you forget something and you really need to take it somewhere, you go into a shock. Oh, no. Now, all of a sudden, what you don't understand, your whole mind is filled with that one thing. Anything that, uh, that, that, that comes after will be interpreted, interpreted <laughs> through the eyes of that which you're living in that present moment. And notice it happened. Jesus says, be careful with the leaven of the Pharisees. It must be because of the bread that we have forgotten. Mm. It's like, what in the world? Like, nothing has to do with this. So I think on the long run, naturally science proves this. Huh. Whenever our hurt and our past is so bothering us, whether to guilt or hurt, when we come across with people, that's how we're going to interpret their friendship. And it's exactly the same thing with God. You know, whatever God says to us, however God relates to us, we tend to go back to the past and use those same principles of whatever things is going on in our mind and interpret God's love, God's
God's mercy, God's justice, and everything. So it is, again, along the same line that you're saying, hmm. healing through the, uh, of those emotional things, then you're clear to receive the real thing without any misconception of uh, preconceived ideas, I guess I could say. Amen. So here's the question. Think about this. 30 seconds. What addictions are you using in your life to numb your pain? <laughs> if there's any. Now, let me add this. Here's, I call them behavior narcotics, behavior drugs. So it's not just alcohol, smoking, drugs. There is socially acceptable Christian that like you can be vegan and overeat. Are you following me? <laughs> to numb your pain. Comfort food, they call it, right? You're comforting yourself with food, right? You can be in ministry, and a lot of ministers go into this, and I was guilty of it, were performance-based ministry because I was, my self-worth was low because my relationship with my dad wasn't that great. I was looking for approval from people, church members. If I preach a good sermon, good sermon, pastor, and I'm looking for approval to build my self-worth up. Does that make sense? A lot of people in ministry looking for healing for themselves, and that's why they go into the ministry of healing themselves. But they're really looking for healing for them. And that's what I was looking for. And I think we can look for religion can become a drug, addiction, right? And you can be so busy, 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 busy. Busyness can be addiction because you want to think about your pain. If you're busy, you never think about your pain. If you're always religious, you don't think about your pain as a numbing and people go, oh, good job. Work can become addiction. Wow, Johnny, you're the best worker here. Good job, Johnny. And you're like, oh, you feel good. You spend all your hours at work. You go back home. No one's saying, good job, Johnny. They're saying, Johnny, take out the trash, right? <laughs> so you rather spend your time at work where your addiction makes you feel good. So it can take any of these. And it looks good. Like, wow, he's such a hard worker. Are you following me? It, and it's good to be a hard worker, but you have to check what is your motive. And even religion, you have to check what is your motive. God, because God looks at, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart, right? God says, if you love me, what does that mean, if you love me? What is that? Question, what else? If, then is what? Conditional. If you love me, then what? Keep my commandments. If you don't love me, then what? <laughs> God doesn't want... God doesn't want obedience from a wrong motive. The Bible says faith which works, right? Faith and works. Faith needs to work, otherwise it's what? Dead, right? Faith works by what? Galatians 5 or 6. Faith works by what? So if faith doesn't have love, it doesn't work. Your motive has to be love because you love God. And that's what God wants for us to have in our hearts. So what addictions are you using to numb your pain? Go talk to each other uh, for a minute. Go ahead. that where we're at? Yes, we're at there. Go ahead, talk to each other. What addictions, whatever it may be, are you using to numb your pain? If there is any. I stress eat. <laughs> okay, wrap it up. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is our last text. Could somebody read that, please? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This is the solution to the wrong picture of who God is. This is the solution. Genesis 3, verse 15. Could somebody read that, please? And I will put between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is God speaking to the devil, to the Satan, to the serpent, and is saying this enmity, this barrier is going to come, which is who? Who is this barrier? Who is this enmity, this barrier? It was Jesus Christ. He's going to be the barrier between humanity and, and the devil and sin. And it said, he, Jesus, will bruise your head, Satan, right? And you shall what? Bruise his feet. So in other words, Satan's going to come on the cross, right? And he's going to bite Jesus on the heel, which he was infected with sin, right? He made sin for us on the cross. So he was bit there with sin, and he died, but he was resurrected. What do you say, amen? amen? But I want you to notice that he said, but this is what Jesus is going to do to you, Satan. He's going to crush your what? Your head. And what's in here? Your what? 
Front the lobes of your head, your thoughts and feelings. In other words, Satan's thoughts and feelings of how he felt and how he thought about God on the cross was crushed on the cross of Calvary. What do you say, amen? amen? All the lies that Satan was saying that God was selfish on the cross, Jesus proved that God is not selfish. He gave, I'll give my life, you know, I love you more than I love myself. What do you say, amen? amen. That's how much God On the cross of Calvary, the, the cross of Calvary crushed the, the lies about Satan and God was not a liar because he said, I'm going to come and I'm going to die for you and you can trust the word of God no matter what hap- happens. Though the heavens may fall and the, and the earth may fall, I still love you and I will die for you. You can trust in me. Amen. What do you say, amen? <laughs> On the cross of Calvary, you can trust him for everything. That God is not abusive. God is not controlling. God is not restrictive. In fact, he's the opposite. He's a loving God who loves you so much. What do you say, Amen. amen. And that's what happened on the cross of Calvary. And notice what it says here. What is that important about God's love? Listen to this quotation, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 76. This is in your handout. God does not employ compulsory measures. Love is the agent which he uses to expel what? Sin from the heart. In other words, without love, you can't have victory over addictions. Without love, you can't have, can't have victory over sin. You can try all you want. You can have the strongest willpower or whatever. Without love, there is no victory. And that's why God wants to show us, that's why God's character is so important. That's why the last message of mercy to be given to, to the world is a revelation of his character of love. Why? Because he knows that the only way this final generation is going to make it in the last days because they must see a clear picture of, the, of who God is, that he is love and he loves you so much. And he'll give everything and he has given everything to reveal to you that he does love you. No matter the world didn't love you, dad didn't love you, mom didn't love you, it doesn't matter because all that matters is that there's a God who loves you. You know, that's the message that brought my wife into the church in my first tent meeting that we'd done in my first church. She said that that night when they preached on the cross of Calvary, was presented in such a powerful way, she couldn't stop crying. She went home and she cried all the way home. And it's that message of the cross, that love of God, that somebody loves me. No one has ever loved me like this, but somebody does love me. It does something to me. It transforms you and it gives you your love and self-worth that you're longing for. Why love is important, but what's so important about the cross? Look at the last quotation. It says this. The revelation of God's love to man centers in the what? Cross. What's so big about the cross? It clearly reveals that there's a God who loves you. And why is it love important? Because without love, we cannot have a victorious Christian life. That's why it's very dangerous to preach sermons telling people what to do, but you don't give them the tools to do it. What if I told you, go out there tomorrow and change the brakes of this car? How many could do it? Let me see your hands. Okay, the ones that couldn't do it. What if I told you to do that? How would you feel if I told you you need to do that tomorrow? (laughs) <laughs> you can't hire nobody. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> but what if you got to do it yourself? How would you feel if I asked you to do something like that? Scared. Scared. What else? Scared. Upset. Scared. Discouraged. Discouraged. Frustrated, right? So what if we tell you, like, you need to do this, you need to, need to do that. That's what Paul says, I'm determined not to know anything but what? Christ and him, what? Crucified, the cross, the love of God. Because he knew that without God's love, you can't have victory. So to tell you what to do without giving the solution or the ability to accomplish it leaves you more worse off. I was alive, Paul says, right, until the law came. Like, the law without victory makes you, makes you more miserable, right? And so my daughter, you know, I, I fix cars a little bit, <laughs> kind of like pastor... Yeah, yeah, I was talking. So, yeah, so just working with that. And I, so I taught her how to, t- to fix the, change the back brakes, the two back brakes, and the, the third one in the front. And then finally I said, okay, this last one, Anya, you're going to have to do it yourself. I'm going to go inside the house, <laughs> and you call me 45 minutes later or whatever. So I, I did that. And she's seen it many times, well, quite a bit of times. And I came out back, and she said, okay, Dad, I'm done. And I went out, and she did it perfectly. Amen. 
But what if I didn't teach her? I didn't give her the proper tools. The proper tools is love. If I preach a sermon and I don't preach love, that's why we should have the cross presented in every sermon, Ellen White says. What do you say? Amen? Amen. And that's like I'm discouraging you. That's why we must preach God's love within every teaching that we teach. I want to see God's love more clearly. How about you? What do you say? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and pray, Lord, that you may teach us to see who you really are, not what people say you are, not what the church says or pastors or anything, but what your word says who you really are. We thank you for that and for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. We are so pleased that you could join us for this special event here at Wachita Hills Academy and College. If you've enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, you can go ahead and like, share, and subscribe to this YouTube channel. Also, if you'd like to support making programs such as these, you can find donation information in the description below. Thank you so much again for joining us, and may God richly bless you.